The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, suffering through pain. My whole body ached. And robbed of her life. Those things I could not do. I just simply couldn't do. Now, see her miracle cure. They know how great God is. On today's 700 Club. Welcome, folks, to the 700 Club. Uh, as we start this program today, I have a word, I believe, from the Lord. You can judge it when it's over. You can say you were either right or wrong, but I want to lay it out right now. The uh, election of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris is not official until the electors are certified by the Congress. Now, that takes place on Wednesday, and that's the 6th. The 6th. That's the most important day. Now, the word I believe I have is that so many people have been praying, and there's so much uh, that has been irregular about this election, not outright fraud, but also just irregularities, not in accordance with the Constitution. And I have been praying, and I'm sure you have been praying, because in my heart, I felt that Donald Trump won the election, and it's been stolen away. But what's going to happen? I believe, and you can judge it now. You can see what happens a couple of days from now. I believe something dramatic is going to happen before the Congress votes on those electors. Something very dramatic that's going to change the outcome of that vote. So mark it down. When it's all over, you can say, well, well old buddy, you, you, you were right on or you missed the Lord. But anyhow, watch it. Something dramatic. The Holy Spirit of God is going to enter in to this situation, and it's going to be something very dramatic. So keep an eye on that, okay? Okay. Okay. <laughs> How about that? It's wide open. <laughs> All right. Well, it's the same. It's the new year, but the same old election drama is underway. And in addition to what I just talked about, a dozen Republican senators and around 140 House members say they will oppose certifying the Electoral College results. Meantime, the media is up in arms. Oh, you ought to watch CNN. It makes you sick at your stomach. But anyhow, the media is up in arms over a phone call President Trump made to Georgia's Secretary of State. Well, what did the president say to ignite this firestorm? Dale Hurd has that. With Congress scheduled to certify the presidential election results in just a few days, at least 140 House Republicans and as many as a dozen senators have vowed to challenge those results. Senators led by Ted Cruz are threatening to reject the electors from disputed states unless there's an emergency 10-day audit. We ought to have a fair inquiry, a fair audit into these results, and, and, we, and we ought to resolve these claims, not just dismiss them out of hand. The fact of the matter is that we have an unsustainable state of affairs in this country where we have tens of millions of people that do not view this election result as legitimate. Vice President Mike Pence's chief of staff issued a statement saying Pence shares the concerns of millions of Americans about voter fraud and irregularities in the last election and welcomes the efforts of members of the House and Senate to raise objections and bring forward evidence before the Congress and the American people on January 6th. House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy is also reportedly supporting the move, but several high-profile Republicans object. Senator Lindsey Graham tweeted, Proposing a commission at this late date, which has zero chance of becoming reality, appears to be more of a political dodge than an effective remedy. Representative Liz Cheney of Wyoming, the third-ranking House Republican, warned it set an exceptionally dangerous precedent. Senators Mitt Romney, Pat Toomey, and Lisa Murkowski say they intend to certify the election results. Meanwhile, a leaked phone call between the president, Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, and others is making headlines. On the recording, Trump asked the Georgia official for an honest statewide election result repeatedly claiming he won the state by hundreds of thousands of votes, but only needs to prove a little under 12,000 to claim victory. So, look, all I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have, 
because we won the state and flipping the state is a great testament to our country because, you know, and there's, there's, there's just a, it's a testament that they can admit to a mistake or whatever you want to call it, if it was a mistake. I don't know. Raffensperger disputed the president's list of claims amounting to massive voter fraud. Well, Mr. President, the challenge that you have is the data you have is wrong. The 117th Congress was sworn in, and Nancy Pelosi was narrowly re-elected as Speaker of the House after Democrats suffered unexpected losses in the 2020 congressional races. The opening prayer by Democrat Emmanuel Cleaver was marked by this bit of politically correct absurdity when he closed by saying, A man and a woman. Control of the Senate is still up in the air, with two runoff races in Georgia to be decided tomorrow. If Democrats win both, the new Senate will be split 50-50. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Well, our chief political correspondent, David Brody, is with us. David, uh, who ever heard of a prayer that says a, a man, which means let it be so in Hebrew, and, and a woman? I mean, what kind of, what's going on in our country? Well, I'll tell you what, Pat, it's out of control. I mean, let's just start with the word dumb. I mean, as you said, it has nothing to do with gender neutrality or any of that uh, mumbo jumbo. Look, what are we going to do now? I mean, is it going to be uh, instead of mentality, is it going to be womentality? I mean, where are we going here, Pat, in this country? Uh, don't even get me started. I know we only have limited time, Pat. Well, David, it, it looks like the, there's, a, there's a madness that sees the population. I mean, literally, I mean, there's, there's a strange psychosis that's gripped our American people. Don't you feel that? I do, Pat, and I think it's all going to come to a head on January 6th uh, in the streets of D.C. You know about that, the big march uh, rally, the big Trump rally, if you will. Uh, it, there could be over a million people in the city. It could be more. Uh, and, and it's going to all come to a head. Uh, you have uh, Trump supporters that are angry, as you know, uh, and it's an angry cauldron uh, that is going to be inflamed even more because there's going to be a debate. Now we know for sure, Pat, there's going to be a debate in the House and the Senate. We know we already have uh, over 140 U.S. congressmen that are, that are going to object on January 6th to these electoral votes, and now you have 13 senators and probably more by the time Wednesday, January 6th gets around. And so you have a situation here that's combustible. You have the streets in D.C. that are going to be filled with anger. You're going to have a Congress that's going to be filled with anger in many spots as well. And you're going to have debate. You're going to have the House and Senate debate. That's what's going to happen. This is not going to be an easy reading of the votes. Uh, they're going to debate each and every one of these uh, these objections. It could be Georgia, Arizona, Pennsylvania, Michigan. Two hours of debate every time, Pat that there is an objection and there will be an objection in multiple states. So this could go on into Wednesday and into Thursday as well, depending. It's going to be a long day. Well, there seems to be some debate also in the in the Democratic caucus. Uh, Nancy Pelosi was reelected as speaker, but she barely held on. What do you think the overall election? I mean, it looks like the Republicans did a whole lot better than everybody seemed to think. Well, that's right. They did. Uh, and now we're going to find out if they can finally put the cherry on top in Georgia uh, come Tuesday, January 5th. Then again, with the election the way it's going, we're, we may not know on Tuesday night, January 5th. Uh, but let's, look, Nancy Pelosi, you're absolutely right, Pat. It was it was a kind of a, a nail biter, if you will, a little bit of a squeaker. I mean, she's got uh, a very little, very little wiggle room there to uh, basically not only win the speakership, uh, but to pass legislation in the House, she's going to need to either keep every single one of her Democrats in line, and good luck with that, with AOC and the squad and all of them causing some mayhem, or she's going to need help from Kevin McCarthy and the Republicans. And so this this is a very tough uh, sledding, if you will, for Nancy Pelosi. And it's interesting. We talked about how Nancy Pelosi is this uh, amazing master negotiator and all of that. She's going to have a lot of problems on her hands in this Congress. Not to mention, by the way, Mitch McConnell, who has been talked about how he's always been able to be this master negotiator in the Senate and the guy that, you know, is just really good at all of this. The problem is he's got a caucus 
uh, that has 13 United States senators that are going to object to the electoral votes. That is not keeping his caucus together whatsoever. It's mayhem in Congress and in the streets come Wednesday, Pat. Well, David, we'll look forward to the mayhem. And as I said, if something happens, as I think it's going to happen, it's going to be dramatic. But anyhow, David, thank you so much for your analysis. Well, in other news, what holds the key to the balance of power in Washington? Well, if the vote goes as we think and the Democrats get the White House and they have the House of Representatives, if they have the Senate too, it's all over. The, the game is over for America. And that boils down now to the state of Georgia. With less than 24 hours to go, both Republicans and Democrats are scrambling to get votes. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau. John. That's right, Pat, and Happy New Year. More than three million people have already voted in Georgia. Now all four campaigns and candidates are in the final frantic push to increase their turnout. CBN's Eric Phillips reports from Atlanta. Over the weekend, scores gather at the Georgia State House for a march and to pray that biblical values be exalted during the Senate runoff elections. Organizers encourage attendees to fast through tomorrow night when the polls close and to do what they can to help voters understand biblical principles. <laughs> Hundreds hit the streets of downtown Atlanta. Organizers making sure people understood this was not a concert or a convention, but a prayer meeting. And we believe in miracles. We Absolutely. believe he parted the Red Seas. We believe that he, the, the walls of Jericho fell because the believers got together. We took a stand. We prayed. We fasted. We repented. We have to do that again as a country or we're lost. And we're declaring that this state belongs to the Lord. We have a biblical foundation. And only those with biblical values or the closest to biblical values should be in office. Though no specific candidates were named, even Evangelicals widely support Republicans, championing causes such as the life issue and Israeli sovereignty. So I've not heard an evangelical utter the words Black Lives Matter. Jamal Bryant, pastor of megachurch New Birth in Metro Atlanta, shares a different biblical view of the runoff. I think it's uh, very scriptural and it calls us into accountability of a small line in sacred text that we often jump over have you considered the poor? And that this election is about health care. It's about uh, employment opportunities. It's about safeguarding higher education and student loan debt. Meanwhile, candidates made the cable news rounds over the weekend, making their final pitches. I am feeling very encouraged by what's happening here on the ground in Georgia. We've had over three million people to vote already during the early period. And it is because they understand how much is at stake. I believe that we'll win on Tuesday because of the grassroots momentum, the unprecedented movement energy in Georgia right now. Raphael Warnock is my opponent. He is someone that would fundamentally change this country. His values are out of step with Georgia. Look, I, I don't think I should be in this runoff if, if everything had happened the way it should have in November. But the only recourse we have is to get out and fight and rise up and vote on uh, January the 5th. Both President Trump and President-elect Biden will be in Georgia today to rally the electorate to show up at the polls tomorrow. Everyone understanding that with the margin so thin, every vote counts. In Cobb County, Georgia, Eric Phillips, CBN News. Some very competitive races there in Georgia, Pat. Stacey Abrams is the one who mobilized people. She ran for governor and lost, but she's come back in as a political organizer. The unfortunate thing is, if, I, if my memory is correct, and I, I don't want to out, overstate it, I believe it's her sister who is the judge who is deciding some of these cases. And so it's been called upon that person to recuse herself from the judgeship because she shouldn't do it, and she refused to recuse herself. And apparently there's been no challenge. But you talk about crooked, I mean, that just smells to high heaven. John? Pat, in other news, COVID-19 deaths in America passed 350,000 over the weekend. But there is some good news as the sluggish pace of vaccinations is expected to pick up. 
The number of shots is now at 4 million, far short of the expected 20 million by the end of 2020. Experts predict the Biden administration should be able to meet its goal of 100 million shots in its first 100 days. One possible solution to faster distribution, cutting the dosage of the Moderna vaccine in half to allow twice the number of people to get the shot. The government's top medical experts, though, divided over that approach. We know it induces identical immune response. We don't know yeah. whether or not that's going to be good enough. Meanwhile, a bill before the New York legislature is causing concern. The proposed law gives the governor the right to detain anyone deemed, quote, a public health risk, including someone who's come in contact with an infected person. Pat? You know, I have been vain against it, and I'll still do it. These shutdowns and lockdowns are insanity. If you want to help a population, look at the vulnerable people, the people who are in nursing homes, the people who have some kind of a, a health condition, those who are very elderly, and quarantine them and then let the rest of the people go and let them go back to school and open up. And, uh, you know, the thing is, it's the fresh air. The fresh air is where, you know, these, these uh, coronaviruses do not congregate in, cl in open spaces. They can go back to football games. I see these football games with nobody in the stands. There's no reason they can't open up in the open air and, and the, the, nobody's going to catch this disease. But it's a horrible thing to think of all the people who died. And, and, uh, but the overreaction is hurting more people. More people are dying. They're starving to death. They're out of work. Businesses are being closed down. It's just insanity. And we are doing more damage trying to fight this thing than the disease itself warrants. And I have said it and said it, and we ought to say it and say it again. But these governors... <laughs> Like uh, the governor of California, when you when you you see the Rose Bowl football game being played in Dallas, Texas, because they can't play it in the beautiful Rose Bowl. You can't have that beautiful Rose Parade and all that because Governor Gary Newsom says, "Well, we think we ought to lock the the state down." He's not really helping. As a matter of fact, the number of COVID cases just keeps on rising. They are doing it wrong. But who am I to tell some governor? that he screwed up. John? Pat, turning overseas, Sunday marked one year since the killing of Iran's General Qassam Soleimani and the Islamic Republic's leaders are vowing revenge, including threats against President Trump. One Israeli publication quoting Iranian President Hassan Rouhani saying Trump is, quote, nearing the end of his life. In a recent cabinet meeting, Rouhani compared Trump to former Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein, who was executed in 2006. Rouhani said Trump could face a similar end. We saw the madman hanged. That was the day when the people celebrated their final historic victory. Trump's fate will not be much better than Saddam's. Meanwhile, Iran informed the United Nations that it will begin enriching uranium to 20 percent at its Fordo facility. That puts Iran one step away from creating weapons-grade uranium. Pat, you may recall a decade ago, Iran's decision to pursue that percentage of enrichment nearly provoked an Israeli strike on its nuclear facilities. Well, I think that uh, we should take this death threat seriously. They literally are going to try to kill President Trump. There's no question about it. And the Secret Service should be on super alert. Uh, the president is very vulnerable when he go, he's going to Dalton, Georgia. And, uh, it's dangerous. And I, I mean, he, he is very open and, and free. And, uh, but these Iranians... They're serious. They really want to try to kill him. And that is not a good thing for any of us. Terry? Well, on New Year's Day, the staff of CBN and Regent University get together for a special prayer meeting. This year, because of COVID-19, our meeting was virtual. Let's take a look now at part of the message Pat shared with us about what to expect in the new year. And what he said to me, and I, I want to share this because I really think I heard from the Lord, is that the number of people who are going to come to the Lord and the number of churches that are going to be founded under the auspices of the CBN is going to exceed anything we have ever seen in the past. It's going to be simply fabulous. And we will see a revival of great magnitude. And God is going to give us the power to, to reach these people. Now, I know in the past we have had 
tremendous success. We've had millions of people who've come to the Lord. But what's coming in this next year and the year afterwards, it's going to be simply fabulous. So get ready. And what he said to me is that for those in authority and all of us at CBN, we cannot be afraid of what God's doing. We can't draw back and say, well, this is just more than we can handle. Because God has said, I'm going to give it to you, and I want you to be prepared to accept it. Well, that's an answer to prayer for a lot of people who've been praying for there to be revival yeah, and an be. outpouring of the gospel. We're going to see it at Regent University. It's going to exceed anything we've ever dreamed possible. It'll be beyond our dreams. And the same thing at CBN. And uh, But God himself is not going to allow the United States to fall into socialism. He's not going to do it. He's going to protect us. And uh, th that's the message that the Lord gave me, and I believe it's true. There's going to be a move of God among God's people. And uh, I am optimistic rather than pessimistic. Good. Well, every year you go and spend time. This year you really took, you went right after yeah, Christmas. I, the, the day after Christmas, and I have had some serious prayer time. And when the, the Lord began to speak about Regent the University and CBN, particularly the blessing of God is going to be outpoured in ways that we have not dreamed. But he is not going to let America fall into socialism. This country, there are too many praying people, too many godly people. And when you think that uh, as God spoke to Abraham, and Abraham began to negotiate over Sodom and Gomorrah, and he finally got it down to 10 people, 10 righteous God was spared. Well, look, think of the hundreds of millions of people who gathered in America to pray. We have a godly, godly group of people, and God is going to spare this land. And I think I can say that very confidently. He is not going to let this country fall into socialism. He's not going to let America be destroyed. But um, that isn't necessarily because of all the people who are clamoring for every kind of sexual license you've ever heard of. I mean, these people uh, resent the evangelicals saying what they say, and yet the evangelicals are the ones that are, uh, uh, because of their prayers, are holding back the, yeah. the tide of God's wrath. So okay. talk a little bit, if you will, about what you feel our role as believers should be at this hour that we live in. Well, I, I think, Terry, that we need to understand that, you know, when the Lord talked about salt and light, we are the salt and light. And he said, if salt loses its savor, it's not good for anything. It's, you can't use it for manure. You can't use it for growing crops. You can't, it's worthless. And I think unless we maintain, it is going to be so easy, though, for the churches to fall into political correctness. And the pressure is going to be enormous. And you look at the number of laws being passed. And if Biden and his crew get in there, they're talking about abortion as a constitutional right. They're talking about LGBTQ uh, as, as being a constitutional right. And any school or any organization that does not give all kinds of freedom to uh, people with various uh, uh, bizarre sex uh, characteristics uh, will be uh, will put upon by the government. Uh, I mean, it's, it's going to be tough. So. It's going to be hard for Christians to, to stand as it was in you know, the days of Rome and as it was in the days of communism. Those who believed in God were persecuted. Mm -hmm. So we, we need to be prepared to stand under whatever circumstances. But I do believe God is going to take charge. He's not going to let it happen. And as I said at the beginning of this program, keep your eyes open the next couple of days. God, the Holy Spirit of God, is going to move in great power to bring something about to keep this, this whole election fraud from being uh, carried out. Okay? Good word. Well, up next, the future is female, at least in the Republican Party. The GOP is sending a record number of women to Congress. What will this mean for 2021 and beyond? Find out after this. Well, Happy New Year to all of you, 2021. Amazing how time has gone by. <laughs> well, here's a quote, the squad doesn't speak for me. 
That's the message sent by millions of women across the country who elected a record number of Republican women to the House. How did the GOP pull off this big win? And why is the writing on the wall for Speaker Nancy Pelosi? Jennifer Wishon has that. Of the 14 seats Republicans flipped in the House, 10 were won by women, mostly in urban and suburban parts of the country. As Congresswoman Susan Brooks prepares to retire from Congress, she leaves a legacy after successfully recruiting and helping elect a new slate of conservative women to Congress. More and more conservative women wanted to raise their hand and say, groups like AOC and the squad do not represent my views. I need to step up and to put my conservative views and what I, how I have contributed to my community forward. I need to make sure that the electorate has another choice. After the 2018 midterms led to huge Republican losses, party leaders vowed to stop the gravitation of women to the Democratic Party. Leaders like Kevin McCarthy and Kathy McMorris Rogers directed more money to conservative women candidates and made electing them a priority. A record 228 women ran, with 94 winning their primaries. The women, I think, just had, had messages that resonated, and they knew their districts. Republican strategists say this will help change the reputation of the GOP being the party of old white men. The Republican Party is diverse, and, and I think that... Um, you're starting to see that reflected in the candidate recruitment. So what can we expect in the 2022 midterms? I would much rather be Leader McCarthy than uh, Speaker Pelosi or whoever comes behind her. That's because after the 2010 census, Republican majorities in state houses across the country dominated the drawing of congressional districts. And there are still a number of districts Trump won in 2016 that haven't flipped yet. Add that to the great migration from liberal strongholds. As more and more Americans leave states like New York and California, those states will continue to lose congressional seats that could go to Republican strongholds. For now, Democrats have seen their House majority diminished. And once again, Best says the elites got it wrong. I think the conventional wisdom in Washington, D.C. and New York City was that uh, President Trump was so unpopular, he was going to lose by a wide margin, and he was going to tank uh, Republicans in the process, and that simply didn't occur. Meanwhile, Congresswoman Brooks is retiring and will fittingly be replaced by a Republican woman who happened to beat another woman running as a Democrat. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News. Well, the ladies are taking over. That's a good thing, I think. Well, I, you know, I do think it brings a, a, a different perspective yeah. to the Republican Party and yeah. a different image, and I think that well, is Well, it's certainly thing. not the party of old white men. <laughs> <laughs> not any longer. Time to All change. Right. Well, uh, coming up, her mouth hurt so bad she couldn't even eat oatmeal. Every bite caused her entire body to ache. So what cured her pain in an instant? You'll find out when we come back. When Judy Turner got new dentures, she never imagined they would cause her entire body to ache. Judy tried to suffer through the pain, but she couldn't even eat. So how was she healed in an instant? Take a look. My name is Judy. I'm retired. I have great, great grandkids, and I enjoy being with my family. I needed a new denture, so on the 1st of July in 2020, I went to an appointment to have dentures made. And I left there and I was so excited and I thought, wow, these feel great. The next day, my gums were hurting. They were starting, had three or four sore spots. They had me come in the next day so that they could make the uh, adjustments again. The pain came back and I was hesitant about making another appointment because when they make adjustments, that um, loosens the dentures and I, I didn't want my dentures loose to where they would pop out and I thought well I'm gonna kind of suffer through this. The pain on a scale of one to ten was at least an eight. I couldn't even eat oatmeal. My whole body ached from that tooth pain. 
I'd have to take my teeth out of my mouth with change. I couldn't speak clearly. It's difficult enjoying grandkids and smiling and having fun with them when you're in pain like that. So those things I could not do. I just simply couldn't do. Thursday, July 13th, I realized I had not taken this to God in prayer. And so I asked God, I said, this pain, I cannot take this. I don't want to have to have this adjusted again. It's going to loosen my teeth and, and, I, and I need you to heal it. I need you to fix it for me. The following Tuesday, I sat down to watch the 700 Club and Terry had a word of knowledge. Someone else you have trouble with uh, um, your mouth, with your teeth, with uh, some kind of dental work that's been given to you that rubs in your mouth the wrong way. God's healing your mouth from all of that. It was for me and I knew it. And I thought, oh, wow. It's going to fit perfectly. You're going to speak perfectly, be able to chew perfectly. The pain was gone. It was gone. Hours before, I couldn't eat dinner because I was in such pain. I clenched my teeth. It was okay. And I knew, I knew that I'd had the healing then. I have a wonderful time with them grands and the greats and the great greats and no, no pain. He healed me 100%. And I've told all of them, they know how great God is. It's so exciting to know my little teeth problem, he took care of for me. He cares about me. He loves me. He loves me. He loves me because he has set his love upon me. Therefore, I will. Okay, Christine, by email, huge praise, Christine says. One day last week, Terry uh, asked, said, you're not asking for prayer on behalf of yourself, but on behalf of a loved one with a brain tumor. And Christine said, that was me. My brother had an MRI and received his result. It's all gone. Zero. Wow. No sign of a tumor. Praise, Praise God, God Almighty. Right. All right. Well, Pat, this is Rose who says, I've had pain in my left shoulder for months. I have joint pain creams and was also given medicine to relieve the pain, but it would return after days of administering the treatment. I've been watching the 700 Club during my lunch hour here in Africa. <laughs> and on December 3rd, Pat prayed for someone with pain in the shoulder that God is taking that away right now now. I touched my shoulder, believed God, and now I can move my shoulder with no pain. I give God the glory. So do we. That's Folks, great. God loves you. And you know, a man had an epileptic son, and he said to Jesus, if you can, uh, you know, do something. And Jesus said, if, I, if you can believe, all things are possible to them that believe. Mm -hmm. All things are possible. Now, Terry and I are going to join hands, and we're going to believe God for miracles. And today's going to be the day of unusual miracles. So get ready, and we're going to pray together. Father, Terry and I join together, and we believe God. Oh, God, we pray in the name of Jesus for those in this audience that are, are suffering. Uh, there's a tumor in, in your abdomen, it's swelled up. I want you to put your hand on your abdomen. That tumor is vanishing and you are completely whole. Uh, the name is Charlene and God, you just got healed. Terry. Yeah, there's someone, you, um, you're a singer or you were a singer and you love doing it, but for some reason you've not been able to sing. Uh, physically, you've not been able to sing. God's restoring that, yes. that ability to you. That you're going to be able to sing praises to Him and there's a joy that's coming with that that is unspeakable. Uh, the, there's arthritis of the spine. You are literally crippled yes. over and you're having a hard time. And right now, it's going to be like fingers are walking up your spine, and you are completely whole. You're standing up straight. And the name is George, I believe. George, receive it now and let the power of God touch him. Terry, one more. Yeah, there's someone else. You have a, a your foot drops like it doesn't, I don't know what's wrong with it, but it drops and you can't control that. It affects your walk, your stability, everything. God is repairing all those ligaments and muscles and everything in your ankle that needs to be restored for that to be perfectly whole in Jesus' name. And may the anointing of the Lord come upon every one of this audience who's crying out to you. And Lord, we pray again for America. We know a miracle is coming. The Holy Spirit of God is moving across mm -hmm. this land, and we're going to see a miracle. We declare it in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. Yes, Lord. Amen. 
and amen. Mm -hmm. We love to hear from you, by the way. If you need prayer, all you got to do is pick up the phone. It's an easy number, toll free, no money involved. If you want somebody to pray with you, they're here to pray. If you want somebody to laugh and cry with you, they'll do that too. <laughs> and more than anything, if you've received an, uh, an answer to prayer, through our prayer or whatever, please call and tell us. We love to hear these reports. It's 1-800. It's easy to remember. 1-800-700-7000. Pick up the phone. Call in. Terry. Well, still ahead, it's a new year, and we're going to ring in 2021 with an all-new edition of Your Questions and Honest Answers. Ann writes, Hi, Pat. Do you believe in New Year's resolutions, and do you have any? Stay tuned for Pat's answer. That's coming up. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. A pastor is dead and two people were wounded in a church shooting in East Texas. Officials say the suspected gunman was on the run from authorities hiding in a bathroom in the Starville Methodist Church near the town of Winona. When the pastor confronted the man Sunday morning, the suspect allegedly disarmed, shot and killed the pastor with his own gun. Two others were injured, including one from a fall. The suspect is now in custody. Well, orphans promise help children affected and families affected by COVID-19 experience a winter wonderland for Christmas in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Working with a local partner, Orphans Promise provided gifts, warm meals, and holiday fun for hundreds of children and their families. Parents were able to shop for their kids in a free toy store, and all who attended experienced the true meaning of Christmas, hearing about the message of the birth of Christ. Well, you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to CBN.com international. Pat and Terry will be back right after this. At all hours of the night, that's when Joyce Mack often calls our 24-hour prayer line. Joyce knows that when worry keeps her awake, someone will always be there to pray with her. And one of her prayer requests resulted in a miracle. What was it? And how did it motivate Joyce to join the 700 Club? Take a look. Retired VA nurse Joyce Mack has been an avid viewer of the 700 Club since the 1970s, when she tuned in to hear Pat Robertson's insights. It kind of taught me how to, to read the Bible, what I was to look for in the Bible. He always went into detail about what it meant or, or what a word would mean. Joyce also followed the 700 Club for another, more personal reason. She often called the 24-hour prayer center to pray for her husband, Otto, a veteran of two wars who was battling PTSD and alcoholism. I would just wake up and be upset. They're the only people I know I can call at 3 o'clock in the morning. During some of their hardest moments, talking with the CBN prayer team gave Joyce hope. We would pray about Otto's drinking. We'd pray about being patient. We'd pray that uh, God would answer the prayer. I usually slept better. <laughs> yeah. Those prayers were answered when a friend led Otto to accept Christ. He immediately stopped drinking, and he and Joyce had a fresh start in their marriage. He was able to love more. Every day we read the Bible together. Every day, Otto insisted on that. Grateful for how CBN had helped her, Joyce decided to become a CBN partner. They have this passion to have everybody know about Christ. I always feel this when they go on there and really preach your need for Jesus. And I, I like that. Otto passed away in 1991, but Joyce still supports CBN. And she's grateful that the 700 Club continues to help people like her around the globe. Whether it's just to touch or to cry with them, or just whisper that God loves you, they're spreading the gospel. I think that is the most wonderful thing in the world. 
Well, Joyce is right that it is our passion to know that people would hear the gospel message and come to know the forgiveness and love of Jesus Christ. She's also right that if you've got an issue at three o'clock in the morning, somebody's here to pray for you. You know, it's so hard in the world, I think, when we are being uh, attacked by various things to know that We've got somebody who's going to stand with us, somebody who's going to be there with us, who's not going to judge us, who's not going to give us empty words, but is going to bring us the word of God. That phone call, that opportunity to have someone to pray with her at three in the morning is because of you, 700 Club members. You make that kind of outreach here at home and around the world possible. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member. It's such a simple opportunity to join with thousands of people in a way that really does touch lives and make a difference. You know, there are many club levels you can give to. Let me show you. That's the general membership at the top there. 700 Club Gold is a gift of $40 a month. You might want to be a 1,000 Club member at $84 a month. So. When you call our toll-free number, there are lots of options, but I'm asking you to do that now. Make it possible for us to be there for people like Joyce and many others. Uh, you've been there for me, and I say thank you to those of you who've joined. But make a difference in the world today with your phone call. And when you call and say you want to join, well, you do it using Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving. It means your bank does all the work. You don't have to worry about anything. You can stop it when you want to, but it saves some administrative costs for us. So even more of your gift can be put into making it possible for us to be there in the name of Jesus to literally hundreds of thousands of people every day. When you use Pledge Express, we're going to say thank you by sending you a Power for Life teaching. You're going to get this every month. We think it'll be a great blessing to your walk with the Lord, and you'll have the privilege of knowing that you are touching and changing lives every day. Well, still ahead, Pat's going to weigh in on the issues that matter to you. Naomi asks, after someone passes away, will they remember anything of their life here on earth? wonder what Pat thinks about that. We'll find out when you ask your questions and he gives his honest answers. It's coming up. Well, it's time for your questions, and Pat's going to answer them honestly, of course. Pat, this is hey. Naomi who writes and says, Hi, Pat. After someone passes away here on earth and they either go to heaven if they were saved and accepted Jesus into their heart, or they go to hell if they weren't saved, will they remember anything of their life here on earth? Um, I think they definitely will. You've got the story uh, that Jesus gave about the rich man and Lazarus. and. And, uh, you know, the rich man woke up in hell and he remembered exactly that he had brothers and stuff on earth. I, I think we have consciousness that the, the spirits we have don't, doesn't, the Lord just doesn't erase our consciousness, but our, the, the body's left, but the spirit is, lives on. And I think it, it's aware of what goes on. So this is Brittany who says, Hi, Pat. I'm a new young mom who's so worried about what's going on and the times that we are living in. I live in New York with my husband and nine-month-old in my parents' house, and it's a very negative, ungodly atmosphere. Besides all that, I'm wondering how I can ask God for a sure sign that we should move to a more Christian conservative state for our protection from what is possibly to come. Is it okay to ask this of God? <laughs> You better believe it. You know, I, I, I was living in Brooklyn, New York, in Bedford-Stuyvesant, and uh, we, we were going to set up a uh, uh, rescue operation in, in the house of a former uh, uh, prostitution uh, right next door to the church. And I was praying and asking God, God, what should I do? And the Lord said, read Jeremiah 16.3, uh, and uh, 2, I forget what, but anyhow, I opened the Bible and said, you shall not take a wife or have children in this place. I said, hallelujah, we're leaving. And I mean, <laughs> you know, God will speak to you. He'll give you scriptures. He'll give you a word. He'll give you confirmation from other people. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's nothing in the world wrong with saying, God, this is an intolerable situation. How do I get out of it? Will you please show me? Mm -hmm. And But it, it looks like he, he wants to set you free from that thing. And so expect an answer. I mean, he doesn't want his people to suffer uh, the way you, you apparently are suffering. All right. Pat, this is Ann who says, hi, Pat. Do you believe in New Year's resolutions and do you have any? Uh, I don't particularly believe in them because I, I, you try to live for the Lord all year round. And 
the idea of a New Year's resolution, you're, you're setting yourself apart for failure. Yeah. So you say, I, I, I resolve that I'm not going to eat any sh sweets the next year. And suddenly, within a month, you're, you're, a box of candy you've got a box of candy. And you're <laughs> gobbling away and say, oh, I've just sinned before the Lord. Uh, but what I do is, is go apart myself, and I ask the Lord for His Word for me, not my Word to Him, but His Word to me. And so if you want to do something, ask God for this year, what is the Word that you give me? And then look at the Bible and see what it says. All right. This is Sandra who says, Pat, I'm not attending a church at this time. What is the best way to please the Lord on the Sabbath? How should we practice the Sabbath? What should we do and what should we avoid doing to please the Lord? Well, look, I, I believe we should have a day of rest. I, I really believe that. And uh, the, the way you can please the Lord, I mean, spend time uh, with the, the Lord in prayer and reading the Bible. Uh, it doesn't have to be on Saturday. It doesn't have to be on Sunday. But there needs to be a time when you're quiet before the Lord. But the Bible does say very clearly, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. So it is a blessing to come together with other Christians mm -hmm. uh, and and not try to live a, a solitary life. All right. This is Joanne who says, Hi, Pat. As a student of the Bible, the times in which we live remind me of when Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dream of seven years of plenty followed mm. by seven years of famine. When the famine happened, the Egyptian people gave up their crops, animals, land, and finally themselves into slavery for food. The state or Pharaoh controlled, owned, owned it all. Do you think this is possible for we the people? Oh, regretfully, it is. You, you know, that's what happened to the communist country. They, the communists said that everything belongs to us. The, the means of production, that's where socialism starts. Socialism means that the government owns all the means of production. That's where you start. Then the government wants more and it says, yeah, but we also own your earnings and then we own your life and we own your livestock. That's what happened in, in, in Russia. So uh, but what happened in in uh, Egypt, I don't think is necessarily a pattern for everything, but I do think, can it happen? Yes, it can happen. This is Catalina who says, what do you think of the death penalty? My friend believes that as Christians, we aren't the ones to give justice and that anyone who's pro-life can't be pro the death penalty. I tried looking up what the Bible said, but I didn't find anything. Can you help me clear this up? <laughs> You didn't find anything. All you have to do is read every every book in the Old Testament, and every one of them. I mean, if if a child is disobedient, they stone him to death. Uh, if if somebody's in, caught in adultery, they they stone him to death. I mean, there is more execution in the Bible. You cannot believe it. Uh, and you know, when you read that that those Israelites were told to come into the land of Canaan where all those uh, wicked people live, and they're supposed to kill every man, woman, and child. So uh, death was not all that bad. And really, you know, when you get right down to the death penalty, you've got Charles Manson, or you've got some uh, serial killer, and what do you want to do? You want to spend twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year housing him for the rest of his life, or would it, would it be more merciful for him and all of us? Uh, to uh, execute him. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the death penalty, uh, but uh, it, it, just the fact that you're pro-life, there's one thing to kill an innocent baby. There's something else for a murderer uh, to have his life taken by judicial process. We leave you with our power minute from Chronicles. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. And tomorrow, we've got a man with a tumor the size of an orange, which vanished in an instant. You don't want to miss that one. For Terry and all of us, thanks for being with us. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.